welcome to another episode of The Platform. Great fun to have writer, producer, director Phil Avalon on the show. He's got a wealth of experience in the industry. He's a cool guy and uh, here he is. Well, Phil, look, it's good to have you on the show, man. I do, I do a show all about stories and uh, I've seen you around the Gold Coast for many years, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're on yeah. your iPad. I'm on the iPad. And we almost yeah, had it. Good to go. I almost had it. Sweet. I'm going to take that off. Take that off. Did you grow up in Newcastle? I grew up in Newcastle, in um, Steel City, Newcastle. And I grew up with a dad that was in a big band and a mum that was also a musician, but a, a school teacher. So I had a little bit of musical background in a Steel City town, which wasn't, uh, you know, didn't entertain that kind of, those sort of arty people. Right, okay. So how did you get into it then, man? Because obviously the movie Steel City that you, that you wrote and produced, how did that come to be? Well, first of all, um, when I got out of the army, I did some time in the army, I met a guy called Mike Webb in the army. And Mike said to me, listen, you should get on my brother's show. It's called Blind Date. Wow. Graham Webb uh, ran it, ran, was, was the uh, host of the show. So I got on the show and Graham said to me, look, the camera likes you, mate. Are you doing anything like drama-wise? I said, no, I, I play a guitar and I'm, I try and sing in a band here and there, but that's about it for me. He said, well, you should. And um, that was the encouragement I needed. I then joined the independent drama school, did two years with them. And when I got out of drama school, I was still very young, um, being a surfer, I thought there's no, nothing about surf culture on the big screen. So why don't I make a movie about that, not knowing anything about finance or, or what you need to do. But I rounded up a couple of boys that were at NIDA, Mel Gibson, John Jarrett and Steve Bisley, and talk them into joining me on a film called Summer City. Oh, Summer City, of course, yeah. And uh, and it was a period film. It was set in the 60s, even though this was the late 70s. Um, we set it in the 60s, and I did. I used a lot of the stories that I'd heard as a, as a kid growing up in Newcastle about a guy in the bushes that would kidnap people and, and uh, spe specifically servers. And I, I, then I put together a story about four guys on a Bucks weekend and set it in the 60s. Right. Lo and behold, when I, I borrowed, I ended up borrowing $66,000 to make the movie. And back in those years, wow, you could buy money. money for that. Yeah. Yep. So I would have been in jail the rest of my life if the film didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work, you know, from the debts. But... Um, the film opened and broke box office records, as we know, and and Mel went on to bigger and better things, as did John and, and Steve Bisley. Everybody from that film, uh, you know, went on to bigger and better things. That must be amazing to look back on because those three, I mean, we all know Mel Gibson is a global superstar, but those other two guys, I mean, they're, they're three iconic Australian actors and it must be incredible for you to look back and think, wow, I, I had them in their first go in my film. Yes, I did, and... And through John Jarrett's encouragement, um, I, I, I then sort of decided from that movie and through John's encouragement, I, I went on to, to do, you know, more stuff. But um, it was an amazing experience because there was a need for that type of film in that era. Yeah. And uh, I still surf to this day and, and, and have done a couple of surf culture type films since, Liquid Bridge. Breaking Loose, uh, Exchange Lifeguards, those sort of films that, if I can, I'll always be leaning towards this, my, my, my love, yeah. which is it. Sport, mate. It might sound stupid, but more a way of life, I suppose. 
say, if you've got any problems or, or worries or anything like that, there's the place to go. <laughs> Just take them all out there and thrash it out on the way. If I'd known, right, you had a stake there, I wouldn't have gone here with a bloody barge pole. I believe. Yeah, yeah you look like you believe. Me. I do. There's a track in the middle of nowhere. You want to be bloody sure it's the right way. Listen, if you want to get out, there's a the door, right? Well, can't you think of anything except surf and sex? None of you know where we are. I thought she seemed like the faithful kind. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Who was he? What was his name? Boy Scout. Boy Scout stuff. He was great. Social intolerance and misunderstanding are the perfect partners in the trial facing the court. Are we to judge the prisoner purely on his actions or his motives? Is he guilty through provocation or impulse? When you wrote the screenplay, how, did you know what you were doing? How long did it take you? It took me six weeks, and, and because I'd written, I'd rewritten A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare whilst I was at drama school. Wow. And the, and the, and the, and the grant drama coach ripped it up in front of the class and said, <laughs> how dare you? Um, I, I really, I, I know, I realised during that period of rewriting that because I was having trouble with a lot of the lingo and, and, and a lot of the dramatics. And um, by rewriting it, it taught me something about structure and dialogue and, and uh, big big picture description, etc., and, and actually three acts. So it did teach me unconsciously yeah. that I could write. And, and um, I went on to do some, some quite a bit more in the writing field and, and uh, been very fortunate that a lot of, them have, a lot of those uh, stories have been produced, not just by me, but by others as well. Yeah, so, so when you like had Surf City come out, and like you said, it was a massive success, I mean, there's some great stories about how like even the way they screened the film back in the day, right? You had all these new ideas, and it, it made it even bigger. Yeah, I mean, at the time, there, um, it, was, it was playing at the Century Cinema in George Street in Sydney, which was right opposite the Hoyt Centre, with, you know, with seven screens. And I went over to Terry Jackman, who, who was running the Hoyt Centre, and I said, look, Terry, I know that you've got the lease on that cinema, but I want to run more sessions. I mean, in those years, there were the, the, the 11 o'clock, the 2 o'clock, the 5 o'clock, and the 8 o'clock sessions. And we were, we were getting full houses, so I said, I want to run. He said, well, you know, it's up to you guys. I mean, you've got to pay staff, and, and, and if you want to do it, go ahead, but you're mad. We did it, and it, it worked a treat. We were actually ended up doing midnight sessions. Wow. And this was the first time anyone had done, done that sort of thing. And then we took it on the road. I, I, I met a guy called Austin Levy who worked in distribution and said, Phil, let's take it on the road. So we took it on the road and hired cinemas and put our own staff in to play it, stand at the box office and sit people down. And that was another another way, you know, and that was most enjoyable because I had the surfboard on the roof. <laughs> Having a good time while you're doing it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, uh, you mentioned you mentioned a film before too, uh, Exchange Lifeguards. So, hey, Christopher Atkins in it, right? That's right, yes. So how did that story come to be? It was funny because I was at, at the Cannes Film Festival with another film, and I, I think it was Fatal Bond that, that, it, that was very, it was a very successful film. It sold very well globally. I mean, Columbia picked it up. It had Linda Blair in it. And um, and Gary Hamilton, who was at Beyond Films at the time, said to me, look, there's a lot of attention on this film. You should be looking at the next project. What are you going to do next? Because the focus is on you because, you, you, you know, you've just done a successful movie. So I said, well, what do you reckon? And he said, well, talk to Vic Bateman and talk to this one sales agents yeah. that are going to buy your next film. So I talked to them, and they said, 
you come from Australia, you've had a big hit with Summer City, why don't you do another surf film? And I went, I'd like to do something more than just surfing, so I'm going to do something about lifeguards. Yeah, yeah, if you do lifeguards, we'll buy it. Wow. So, all right, okay. So I went home and I wrote the story, Exchange Lifeguards, and I'd met um, Elliot Gould when I lived in America, and he was another one that was encouraging me. Yeah. And I, I, So I rang Elliot and I said, look, I've written a part for you in this movie I've done called Exchange Lifeguards. He was in a play, uh, Othello. He was doing Othello in Canada at the time. He said, send me the script. So I sent him the script. He said, I love it. Who, who's playing my son? And I said, I, I'd like Christopher Atkins because uh, I talked to Christopher. He was with the same agent as I, and he said he'd be in it. He said, oh, Chris is doing a, a show with my son, Elliot Gould's <laughs> son at the time. I love Christopher. So that helped me with a deal. So then I had Christopher Atkins and Elliot Gould, and I, casting locally, uh, we started screen testing people, and we screen t- tested a guy called Julian McMahon. And he was doing jeans commercials and things at the time, and he did a terrific audition. So we cast Julian in his first movie role. Wow. We've been very lucky with talent, casting talent, you know, in the right places. And uh, and the film, again, was very successful. And thank you to uh, everybody on it, including the director, uh, Morris Murphy, who had just come off Fatty Finn. Wow. And I said, you want to do this movie? And, and, and I, he, he liked the script, and there you go. That's how it happened. This is what we can sell with our new development in Australia. Sun, beaches, lifeguards, pretty girls. Mullet Beach has everything that we need. I think we should move on this, Father. Oh, that coastline is some of the prettiest on Earth and the easiest to develop. You will be the exchange lifeguard on that plane to Australia, even if you can't swim a stroke. They don't know who you are, so try and keep it that way. Memo. My father reckons they're the greatest people in the world. So far, i found Australians to be nothing but a bunch of cheap, incompetent hustlers. I want the community to work with us. They will. They will. How these bunch of nerds ever survive at all is beyond me. McCain's bulldozing this clubhouse will be a community service. As far as Mullet Beach goes, this place is a paradise. Doesn't look like much of a lifeguard. <coughs> <coughs> So where do you stand, for or against? It's not my town. I sunk a lot of money into this. You've been down here for five minutes and already you're making negative decisions. Negative? So what do we do? Stall them. I'll get the company back. If we can just get our hands on those deeds. Honey, are you okay? Uh Well, unlike you, I'm not here under false pretenses. They know who I am, and I know exactly what you two are. Don't worry, everything's under control. Obviously, always been creative, and, and when you're producing, I imagine it to be, you know, you, you're juggling all the balls of everything going on. It must be at times a nightmare. But how, how do you find it if you explain it? Like, what does a producer do, like yourself, when you're putting a project together? Well, first of all, you've got to have a good script, right? You must have a good script. That's it. And I, you've got to spend the money in development. I mean, everybody freaks out about the word finance, but in reality, I was spending at least a hundred thousand dollars per film in development, wow. developing the stories properly. Fortunately, because I'd done a lot of films and I was getting, you know, I was getting a reasonable, respectable wage, I was, I could do that. And also the government agencies assisted me because I made films that were travelling well globally. So that was the first equation, good script, and then you've got to balance the creatives with the financial. So I, I'd say... Okay, because of my work in distribution, 
and, and work, going to all of the film markets. I had an idea of what that film may be able to gross if I did it properly. Right. So then I would be able to budget the film early to think, okay, this is going to be safe for the investors. And I always put my investors as if they were me. Yeah. And I always invest in my own films. I always be the first one in to show other investors that I have the confidence. Yeah. So I think that's important in, 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 in the world of independent film. Yeah. Maybe. Awesome, yeah. man. And so, you know, a film like Liquid Bridge too, I mean, you talk about being lucky with casting or being clever with casting. I mean, Ryan Quanton went on to do some great things, but at the time he was like a home and away kid, right? That's right. He was. And um, the wonderful Greg Apps, who I, I brought in to cast the film, you know, as a casting director, he put Ryan up along with others. We, you know, there were nine, nine uh, shortlisted. And I kept going back to Ryan because... I was directing the film as well as producing this time. And I thought, can I work with this guy? And after the second audition, I, I realised what a talented young actor he was. And hence he got the role. And, of course, and the picture again, uh, Paramount picked that picture up and, and Ryan went on to bigger and better things and is still still very uh, popular out there. Yeah. You know, after after uh, some very good films and, and that television series, Blood, like, True Blood? Yeah, True Blood. You served better than ever, Nick. Nice butts. I'm uh, Jeanne. You're a lucky guy, then. Yep, I know. She's the best. Who's that? That's my dad. I really broke his back in 1977. Couldn't bear it if you ended up like him. Some of the best are scared of big waves, Nick. It's no disgrace. I'm joining the tour, that's what's happening. She's behaving like a selfish, jealous father, and it stinks. You got two bloody little things, there. I can fix your West Coast supply problems. In a week, my boys can move four times what I owe. And I got the perfect young rider in mind. If surfing the islands is so important, how come six out of the top ten are Aussies? Are you saying islanders can't surf? Oh, man, whatever. You told the world that islanders can't surf? They invented the sport. I'm losing my mind here, man. You don't know what I'm going through here! Do you want to die? Just keep taking that crap, man! Do it for Get off my back! Well, it's can't hurt, right? <laughs> Show some respect. You're going to have to come along with us, son. Tony, they think I'm some kind of drug lord. Don't worry, what are you talking about? You're not guilty, so you've got nothing to worry. They found two keys of smack in my room. Did you and Mr. Sanders purchase heroin and smuggle it into Coral Island? No. That is your surfboard, is it not? I left the surfboard in Mexico. You're lying. I'm telling the truth. Do you know this man? He's one of Tony's friends. I met him in Mexico. What's going on, Tony? I'm getting a lot of heat here myself. There was nothing I could do. Shut about up! He wants me to sit around and do nothing while you go to jail for 20 years? I want you to be careful. Just, hey, just turn it off. Turn it off. Because you're in that chair doesn't mean you have to give up on life. It's easy for you to say, my friend. You've got two good legs. Get on for it. Your boy needs you. You've got more talent in your little finger than I ever had, Nick. I always thought that I could, I could do it on my own. But standing up here now, I realise no matter what you achieve, somebody always helps you. How did the Gold Coast come into your world? I mean, I know I don't know if you still live on the houseboat, but I saw some awesome pictures on your Facebook. But how how did you come up here? Uh. Well, I got divorced uh, in Sydney. Uh, I was working too hard, and, and my marriage broke down because I, I, that year I did Liquid Bridge. I did three films that year. Wow! And it was taking so much time and, and pressure, and and I, uh, pressure on my home life as well. Um, you know, the divorce happened, and I moved from Sydney. I had a studio at the time in Sydney, and I moved from Sydney to the Gold Coast uh, to. to chill out, so to speak, and, and get away from the industry, get away from everything. And the houseboat equation came into my mind, but basically it was just about travel. I, I, it was First of all, it was a caravan, and then it, it became a houseboat. And um, 
the housemate, I've got to say, I've just come off it, was probably the, the nicest and best and most relaxed three and a half years I've had in my life. Wow. Absolutely wonderful being parked out on a lagoon near SeaWorld <laughs> with a water, it had a water maker and it had um, solar power. So I didn't need to go anywhere. It was all there. And I had an office upstairs and my girlfriend set up the office to uh, so I could continue, you know, working on the movies. And I did I did a movie while I was on that house. Wow, did. that's cool. Yeah, so I'm back on land now, but uh, I, I certainly will... Get back to the houseboat sometime. Yeah, well, life. I'm sure, like myself, when people see those pictures on your Facebook, they get pretty envious because, I mean, to wake up and see that view every day is pretty awesome. Oh, it was absolutely fabulous. And, you know, the, the sea life, uh, you know, the dolphins coming around and, and uh, you know, crabs, you're catching fish and crabs. You, could, you know, <laughs> you could virtually just live there on that, you know. Oh. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. And plus... For me, I could get in the dinghy and go to the beach, which is only a two-minute ride across to SeaWorld, yeah. walk across the car park, go surfing. Wow. So you can work, you know, every which way. So, you know, when you look back on your career, it's been it's been a long one. You've been involved in so many projects. What, what advice would you have for other young people out there or the things you've learnt that you could share with them? Okay. First of all, make sure... You know, get into a film community. There's so many little film communities around the, especially around the Gold Coast. All of the universities have little film schools or communities. Get into that so that you've got access to cameras, lighting, and, and knowledge. Mm. You know, even though you may not be attending the college, if you hang in there with the guys, like a couple of my mates. Uh, you know, teach those film skills, and they'll say to me, "Can you come along and do a lecture?" Which I do, and um, I can see around me that he wants to be a, a cinematographer, she wants to be a, a, a makeup artist. Get those people together and, and do the little stuff, you know, the short films. Mm. And that's the way. I, 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 look, all of the, these film skills are the pushing people out, and I see it all the time. And I go, "Where are they going to be employed?" You know, all of these people that are pushing out of film schools, not just here on the Gold Coast, but nationally, if they're pushing out five, six thousand people a year, they're not all going to be employed. Yeah. So another thing I always say is have another job, like waiting tables, coffee, whatever you're doing. Have something else to back up that, that love and interest because if you're sitting there by the phone, it quite often ain't going to ring. Yeah. You've got to get into a little like-minded community yeah okay That's nice. yeah. well i love asking people feel about chasing dreams and, and i mean no one sort of gives up on what they're doing and i can tell you've still got stuff bubbling now but if you could live the ultimate well, dream for you what, what is it well um in the film world just yeah look, or in life okay look i did a stage play as a, before i did summer city i wrote and directed and produced a stage play called the backstreet general it's always been my first love. I've had several close calls about getting it up. And in fact, I had it financed twice now in my life. Wow. And both times I pulled it, pulled it out because I didn't believe the script was right. Now, only last year, I worked with a guy called Greg Clayton, and we, we got a draft that I'm finally happily, happy with. So that's the film that I want to sign off on. Nice. And it's, you know, it's a Vietnam uh, coming home type story, and uh, but updated to, to in today's world, updated. Right. So that's, uh, that's, that's my, we've all got a dream, and that's my dream to now I can focus on getting that together. It won't be for another, at least another 12 months, yeah. because we've got other stuff on the plate. But at least now I'm happy with the script. I know I can direct it. I just got to cast it right and have the wonderful crew that I've had over the years join me on that project. Awesome, man. Well, it's been great to quickly catch up with you via Skype on the Gold Coast somewhere, and uh, thank you for being on, and all the best with everything. Thanks a lot, Andy. Good stuff, mate. Yes, yeah, so there you go. Great to catch up with Phil. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the platform.